Hi everybody and welcome back to video number two in chapter 15. And when we left off, <clears throat> we were looking at stock warrants issued with other securities. When the stock warrants are issued with bonds, the stock warrants may be detachable or non-detachable. What that means is detachable means that the warrants may be sold separately from the bonds. Non-detachable means they can only be sold with the bonds. So non-detachable warrants do not require an allocation of the proceeds between the bonds and the warrants. Like the accounting for convertible bonds, companies record the entire proceeds from non-detachable warrants as bonds payable. Pretty easy there. Now, the synthetic convertible debt formula, here we have debt plus the non-detachable stock warrants, and that's going to equal your synthetic convertible debt, a new definition and formula. Let's take a look at an illustration. Chan Company issues 10 bonds with a total par value of $10,000 and detachable stock warrants, which provide the right to buy 500 shares of Chen stock over the next five years at $20 per share. The $20 is often referred to as the strike price. New investing terminology for you. <laughs> so what are the alternatives that you, the investor, have related to these detachable stock warrants. Well, given that the stock warrants are detachable, you can sell the stock warrants to another investor and continue to hold the bonds. Or you can sell the bonds and not the stock warrants. If you keep the stock warrants, you can exercise the stock warrants and receive shares in the company. Recall that if stock warrants are non-detachable, the stock warrants cannot be sold separately. Therefore, both the bond and the stock warrants must be sold together. All right, there's two methods available to determine how much of the proceeds from the sale should be allocated to each security. Just like we had in chapter 13, we have to have the proportional method and the incremental method. So here, under the pro proportional method, we're going to, one, determine the value of the bonds without the warrants, and then two, value the, the warrants. The proportional method allocates the proceeds using the proportion of the two amounts based on fair values. Okay, let's take a look at an illustration. This is the proportional method with detachable warrants. So the Durand Company issues 10,000 bonds, each at $1,000. Each bond has a detachable warrant allowing the holder to purchase one share of $5 par common stock at $25 per share. The total issue price was $10 million. Soon after the issue, the bonds sold for 99 without the warrants. The market price of the warrants at that time was $30. How would Durant allocate the proceeds between the bonds and the warrants? Well, here's, a, here's how we would do that. Where the fair value of the bonds without the warrants would be the $10 million times the 99% or 9,900,000. The fair value of the warrants would be 10,000 warrants at $30 per warrant or $300,000. So the aggregate fair value is 10,200,000. So now we would just uh, act allocate to bonds and warrants based on the 10,200,000 and the 
9,900,300,000. And that comes out to $9,705,882 and $294,118 for a total of $10 million. So our journal entry then would be a debit to cash for $9,705,882 and the discount on bonds payable would be $294,118 and our bonds payable which was written on the bonds $10 million. In addition Durant sells warrants and credits the proceeds to paid in capital. It makes the following entry. It debits cash for $294,118 and credits paid in capital stock warrants for $294,118. So the allocation of the issue price relies either on an estimate of fair value of each security, generally as established by an investment banker, or on the relative fair value of the bonds and the warrants soon after the company issues and trades them. All right, now we'll take a look at the incremental method. In some instances where the company cannot determine the fair value of either the warrants or the bonds, it applies the incremental method as used by lump sum security purchases, which we explained in chapter 14. The company uses the security for which it can determine the fair value and allocates the remainder of the proceeds to the other security. So, let's take a look at the incremental method with detachable warrants. We'll use the same example we did before in the prior slides. And here we're going to assume that the fair value of the Durant warrants is 300000 but the company cannot determine the value of the bonds without the warrants. So, how would they allocate the proceeds between the bonds and the warrants in this situation? So the lump sum weight is going to be $10 million. We know that $300,000 applies to the warrants. So the balance then we can allocate to the bonds. So they can now make our journal entry to cash uh, $9,700,000 discount on bonds payable. We'll debit and credit bonds payable for $10 million. And then we'll debit cash for $300,000 and credit paid in capital stock warrants for $300,000. Okay, stock warrants rights to subscribe to additional shares. A stock right, existing bondholders have the right, is called a preemptive privilege, to purchase newly issued shares in proportion to their holdings. That way they don't suffer dilution. The price is normally less than the current price of the shares, and the companies make only a memorandum entry and no journal entry is required when the company issues stock rights to existing stockholders. All right, let's take a look at an example as to how we're going to account for dilutive securities. Klinger Company issued $2 million of 5% 10-year convertible bonds on April 1, 2025 at 98. The bonds pay interest on October the 1st and April the 1st. 
Bond discount is amortized semi-annually on a straight line basis. On April 1, 2026, one year later, 1.5 million of these bonds were converted into 30,000 shares of $2 par value common stock. So here we're going to do a series of entries. So let's look at alpha. Alpha, we want to prepare the entry to record the issuance of bonds on April 1, 2025. So here, all we're going to do is take $2 million times 98%. That gives us the amount of cash we're going to receive, 1960000 So we have a discount then on bonds payable, which will debit for $40,000 and credit what's written on the bond for $2 million. Now, under Bravo, we're going to prepare the entry or entries to record the conversion on April 1, 2026. The book value method is used. So we're going to assume that the entry to record amortization of the bond discount and interest payment have been made. So we're going to debit bonds payable for 1.5 million. We'll credit the discount on bonds payable for 27,000. And we get that by taking the $40,000 discount, dividing it by 20 periods. That gives us $2,000. Okay. So the un unamortized discount on 100% of the bonds is 36,000. And we're going to take times the percentage of bonds converted. So that's 1.5 million divided by 2 million or 75%. And the unamortized discount on converted bonds, therefore, is $27,000. The carrying value of the converted bonds is $1.5 million minus the $27,000. And that gives us $1,473,000. From that, we will subtract the par value of the common stock, which is $60,000. Therefore, the paid in capital in excess of R is $1,413,000. So coming back to our Bravo journal entry here, we're going to have the $27,000 discount on bonds, which we calculated here. The common stock, which is the par value. And the paid in capital in excess of R. One. Okay. Now, under Charlie, we're going to assume that instead of convertible bonds, Klinger issued 2 million bonds without a conversion fee feature at 102 on April 1, 2025. Each $1,000 face value bond was issue issued with one detachable stock warrant. Shortly after issuance, the bonds were selling at 98 the warrants had a fair value of $30. So we want to prepare those entries. So if we look at the Charlie entries here, we're going to debit cash for the $2 million plus the 2% premium. And now we're going to credit the bonds payable for $2 million. We will credit discount on bonds payable for $20,594, which represents $2 million minus $1,979,406. How did we get that? We took the, the um, 2 million and 20,000 and divided that into 1960000 and then multiplied that times 2 million 
and 40,000. 